Coming up on this week's show, an amazing new 2019 Sega Mega Drive game. How to turbocharge your Amiga 500 with the help of a Raspberry Pi. And we talk Lotus, Supercars, Kickstart and more with the legend that is Sean Southern. This week's show is brought to you by Bitmap Books and their brilliant new metal slug, The Ultimate History Book. Pre-orders start next week at bitmapbooks.co.uk. And our good friends at The Economist, the smart guide to the forces changing your world. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 184, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And is that it? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's just us two today, Dan. It's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah, like old school today, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Last week, we we, did, we had more people in the studio than we had microphones. We had to double up last week. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> it, it was fun, though, yeah, having absolutely. our friends over. Yeah, totally. But this week, a little bit more reserved because, let's be honest, this week's show is going to be all about the guest. Yeah, because this guy is such an amazing developer, and it's Sean Southern. Yeah. Um, Oh my god! If if you've played racing games on the Amiga or any of these old school systems, Sean would probably have part of them. You know, you remember the Lotus series. Oh my god, yes! But also supercars. Do you remember supercars? Yeah, the supercars above view it. one. That that was a really good fun game. And for me as well. I mean, on the on the Commodore eight bit machines, um, Kickstart two. Um, I know that was an amazing game on the Commodore sixty four. But for me as well, you know, being the uh, Kind of the black sheep at school, the kid that had the the computer that nobody else really had, the Commodore Plus 4 slash 16. Sean Southern was actually probably the best developer on that system. So it's going to be interesting to find out why he stuck to that, what was so endearing about it, and how he squeezed like so many good games out of a system that no one else really could. Well, you know that magnetic fields intro that yeah. you used to see on games? For me, that was like a sign of quality. Yeah, well, you got that sound effect as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's but, not accurate at all. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Whenever you saw his name associated, particularly with the racing games, I think you always knew it was going to be an amazing experience. And we did have his, um, you know, you kind of could say his business partner for many years, Andrew Morris, on the show a couple of years ago. So really, Sean was the guy behind like designing and programming the games, and Andrew was a graphics guy. Well, you know, the importance of racing games, uh, keeping that frame rate, keeping that speed, being able to keep it playable. And also, he even brought that into his later programming with stuff like, oh, God, Kid Chaos, if you remember that, (laughs) which was kind of a Sonic clone on the Amiga, but it was incredibly fast. And the parallax was really nice, and it had a beautiful frame rate. And that's the kind of consistent things that Sean's done throughout his career. And it was always the thing, wasn't it? Everyone wanted Sonic on the Amiga, and no one could ever do it. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Apart from Sean. Um, Unfortunately, that was right at the end of the Amiga's life, and I don't think it sold very many. But, I mean, we are going to get some incredible stories. So, um, you know, so I could probably do four hours with Sean alone, but I'm going to try and cram it all in to this one-hour show this week sean southern the legend that is is going to be on our podcast in around 15 minutes from now i've got to give a quick thank you to alan from uh, main meister on youtube as well um top bloke we see him at retro events and stuff too but he helped hook me up with sean as well he did oh, a great awesome. interview with him. yeah really top bloke. yes yeah, so if you want to see more about sean um i'll put his interview he did on youtube as well there's not many interviews out there with sean bizarrely considering what a legend he is so uh Really going to enjoy this. It's coming up on the show very soon. Now, of course, we do bring the Retro Hour podcast out every single Friday. It lands on your iTunes feed or your podcast client of choice. And we love doing this show. You know, getting talked a bit about Sean Southern, come on. But we do appreciate any help that we get into the running of it. Now, the podcast will always be free. We'll always release it for free for you guys. But, I mean, think of it as a tip jar. If you'd like to donate, I don't know, maybe the cost of a cup of coffee. Yeah, and it really helps us going because sometimes on the show we have advertisers, but sometimes we don't. So it's just good to keep us chugging along. And you'll learn a place in the very prestigious Retro Hour Hall of Fame, the best high score table in the world of retro gaming. Just like this week, Kenneth O'Toole, Steve Netting, Carl Kouros, and Asen Ivanov, who all made donations into the running of the show. And if you'd like to do the same, some people do say, what's a PayPal address? I just want to do it from the app. It is paypal at theretrohour.com, or there is a supporters button on our website at theretrohour.com. And I recognise a couple of those names. Kenny from um, Ireland, Amiga Island. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Steve Kenny. Netting from uh, Lag, I think, as well. Oh, mate. Well, look, guys, we really appreciate that. Thanks so much, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. And also this week, let's give a massive thank you to this week's sponsor, our great friends at Bitmap Books. Now, today we're talking about this incredible new book. Pre-orders for this start next week on the 8th of August. Metal Slug, The Ultimate History, the first officially licensed book to document the history 
of one of gaming's most beloved franchises. And we thought, you know, since we're talking about this new book, and it's obviously such an incredible series, and Sam's books are always so good, we thought we'd get him on to talk a bit about it. Let's welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, the man behind Bitmap Books, Sam Dyer. Thank you. Now, tell us a bit about why you've decided to do um, a book about Metal Slug. Well, I worked with SNK a couple of years ago, as a few of your listeners may know, um, produced a book called Neo Geo, A Visual History, which was great to work with SNK directly. It was all official and it had loads of really great assets in. Um, That book was really well received. SNK were really happy with it. So we started getting talking about you know what we could do next together and I've always been a huge fan of Metal Slug and I knew there was kind of like an interesting story behind the creation of it and said to them would would this be a possibility and they were really really excited about doing a dedicated Metal Slug book so yeah that's kind of how it started really. And there's so many kind of Metal Slug games but there's also like a Western version of Metal Slug and a Japanese version of Metal Slug as well. Yeah there's there are so many different games and i didn't realize how many different platforms as well you know windows mac um arcades so many different platforms but yeah um i believe on the arcade machine you could you could sort of um the the japanese ones had all the blood and gore in so if you play it on sort of like main you can you know you can toggle that sort of stuff and this is the first officially licensed but the first one that they've endorsed yeah this is the first ever official metal slug book that's ever been produced i don't believe there has actually ever been a there's been sort of guide books in the past but never a book that really talks about the the roots of the game and how it came about and really sort of showcases the graphics well a lot of the developers were japanese who were the guys that you've been talking to in this this was i think this is probably one of the biggest sort of selling parts of the book really was the fact that we managed to um interview 11 different developers that worked on metal slug through varying sort of eras um and i don't know how how much you sort of know about the sort of how metal slug came about but it was actually the sort of the roots of metal slug are in um irem so in the early 90s irem made a couple of games called in the hunt and gun force 2 and if you look at those two games they do look in sort of art style animation um very sort of metal slug and that's because some of the original team members worked on those games. And then they broke away and formed a company called Nazca, which, who developed the original Metal Slug. And we have um, interviewed Kazuma Kujo, Takushi Hayamuta, and Atushi Karuka, who were sort of three members of Nazca. And we've also um, interviewed a couple of guys called Sunichi Hamada and Takishi Akui. I don't believe a lot of those guys have been interviewed before. So to speak to them and really understand, you know, the ins and outs of how Nazca came about and how Metal Slug, why it looks like it does and why it plays like it does and where they got all the ideas from, it's been huge. And these interviews are really, really in-depth. And one thing about your books as well, Sam, is, I mean, they're always beautiful. I mean, you always pay real attention to, you know, the, the amazing artwork. I mean, have you kind of, have SNK given you access to, like, you know, all, all of the, the artwork and illustrations, and have you got any exclusives in there? Yeah, so the thing with the Metal Slug is quite a lot of it is available online already, but I think it's sort of showcased in a in a really nice way, sort of, you know, sprite sheets and level maps. But one of the things we've been really, really lucky with is one of the interviewees that I mentioned early, uh, earlier, a guy called Takishi Akui, he actually has given us access to some of his original design documents oh, wow. from Metal Slug and SNK don't even have these. This is something that he kept when he when he left Nazca and went to um, work for his, another company. And these these things have never been shown before online. So... We've got development sketches of the Nazca logo and a lot of original sketches of what Metal Slug looked like before you actually played as Marco and Tama. Before you were actually playable characters, Metal Slug was actually, you actually can just controlled the tank. And there's a lot sort of, of sort of few myths about this online and quite a lot of um, 
you know, people um, sort of telling the story, but to actually see these documents and actually interview these guys and find out was really, really cool to find out. It's one of the main reasons why I wanted to do the book to kind of really tell that story. So anyone who's a fan of the Metal Slug franchise has got to check this book out. Now, pre-orders are going to start next week on Thursday, the 8th of August. That's correct. Yeah, they'll go live at 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, UK time. And that'll be on your website, bitmapbooks.co.uk? That's correct, yep. And there's going to be a, there's a standard edition of the book. And as usual, we we like to do sort of like special editions, which will be limited to the pre-order period and sort of limited in numbers. Um, We've, this time, we've called it the fully loaded edition of the book. And it's going to come in a slipcase. And it's going to come with a glow-in-the-dark poster and a postcard which is illustrated by Tonko, who is an illustrator who did loads sort of metal slug work. But the cool thing about the slipcase is that it actually plays sounds when you touch it. Oh, wow. So there's going to be a series of sort of like hidden buttons on the front of the slipcase. And when you press it, it will say like heavy machine gun or rocket launcher or, you know, grenade launch, all those sorts of classic um, pickup sounds you get from metal slug. So something I've wanted to do for ages is to put sort of actual physical sounds in a book or a slipcase, and we managed to do it this time, and it's it's pretty it's pretty cool. <laughs> well, you know, your books are always incredible, Sam. So I know, I know you'll do it justice. So um, the book is called Metal Slug: The Ultimate History, and we'll put a link in our show notes at theretroad.com. Sam, it's always great to catch you up. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much, guys. Now. At the moment in Britain, we seem to be, you know, we're, we're on a bit of a mission to change all our money into like this kind of a uh, plasticky kind of notes that we've got now. Yeah, I noticed that quite a lot of the world, they'd had this plasticky yeah. note thing and now we've just started to get into it and it's with the £50 notes. But the whole argument was like, who can we have on the £50 note? Yeah. And we wanted to represent science. And I find it great that the two kind of leaders were Alan Turing yeah. and Ada Lovelace. So... Alan Turing was the inventor of the digital computer during World War Two, and Ada Lovelace was kind of programming in her head in Edwardian times. So yeah, she, I mean, she was like the mother of computers, really. Yeah, she? yeah. Well, computer programming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's just absolutely fantastic that they're celebrating it. And what they've done is they've hidden a binary code inside the banknote, which, if you kind of convert it into decimal numbers, it reveals Alan Turing's birthday. <laughs> so go on, then, Ravi. What, what's the code? One zero one zero one 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 zero zero one. Well, I can't do this. Too many ones and zeros. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for someone to run that through like a binary translator yeah. and see if you did it right. But it is, like you said, it's great that they're honouring Alan Turing on the front of the new um, fifty pound note here in Britain as well. Um, I must admit, I don't get many fifty pound notes. No, I think <laughs> they kind of took them out of circulation for yeah. a while, or places would not accept them. That's why they're probably replacing them because. Uh, there might have been a lot of naughty copies out there or something. Yeah, exactly. I remember the pound coin, they like checked them and they were like three quarters of them are fake. Really? So we had to change it to that um, octagon kind of shape. Is that why I checked? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, because they were just making fake ones in back gardens. Yeah, because it does make sense whenever you go into a shop over here, it's always like, you know, 50 pound notes are not accepted. Yeah. So I guess, you know, having this new um, design that they make them on as well makes them more secure. Um, they're going to be in circulation. It's polymer it's made of um, by the end of 2021 as well. So great choice having Alan Turing on there. Now, Amiga accelerators are always pretty sexy, aren't they? Yeah, now I got told about this by Adam, actually, who uh, we had on the podcast yeah. last week. And this is an amazing thing. It's called the A314 Project. And right. uh, it's available on GitHub. But what it is, is it's a trapdoor expansion card for the Amiga 500. But you have a Raspberry Pi supported on it. Now, the Raspberry Pi is plugged into it via the GPIO ports. Oh, the pins on the on Yeah, the Raspberry so Pi, that yeah. will be on like a trapdoor expansion card and then you'll attach it with the pins but what you can do with this this is really impressive stuff i didn't even think you'd be able to do this you can change it into a pio device so like your dfo or dho which is your hard drive or your disc you can make the pi be used for file exchange it's like a disc yeah so you can have it as mounted as a kind of disc on your amiga but imagine if you've got big transfer files that you have to put over there you download one on your pi straight away and then you can just drag it onto your amiga which is really nice but also what you can do is you can execute commands on the pi from amiga dos shell so you can open workbench on your amiga get the the command line up and then run programs on the raspberry pi from the amiga yes so there's some level of it talking between it 
But the craziest, craziest, craziest thing is they've developed a, a way that you can control your Amiga through the web browser. So it's kind of like, you know, VNC or one of these virtual boxes. Yeah. Which is amazing. It will catch all the mouse movements, the clicks, absolutely everywhere. So does this mean I could then, like, you know, be on another machine or, or in another place at work? Could yeah, I be yeah, using my Amiga? Yeah, you could work. Anywhere with okay. a browser, you wow. could connect <laughs> and it would be drawing directly from your Amiga. It wouldn't be like a... A, a weird bridge in between. It would right. be coming straight from the chip RAM. Because I know there is similar things for, I think it's a BBC Micro you can use, like a Raspberry Pi is like a, and a, you know, their version of the accelerator. Um, and the thing about it is when you, when you normally get this kind of supercharged hardware for older machines, traditionally in the past have always been really expensive. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've got Pi sitting in my drawers and like Amiga 500s there's a lot of them available so this is kind of a good combination of stuff that's just randomly there yeah I think Raspberry Pi just fell out your pocket Rav you got that yeah. Yeah, everywhere aren't they everywhere so if you want to check that out it's open source as well which is amazing I love the fact that they're doing so many of these you know like the terrible fire project you know the, the cards for yeah it. yeah because yeah. it would just be what people can do with it in the future and as yeah. Pi's get more powerful you know so um, if you want to check that out, definitely worth a look if you're a fan of the Amiga and you want to do some cool things with your Amiga 500. Looking forward to the YouTube video that Ravi will uh, invariably make. <laughs> when I manage to launch a nuke from my Amiga 500. <laughs> End it all. Yeah. <laughs> now, the Mega Drive, of course, is a system that's had a lot of love in recent years. It's cool when new games are announced for it as well. I mean, recently, I think some of the games that we've seen on the Mega Drive have been some of the most creative and best looking games that I've ever seen on the system. Yeah, so we've got Mega Cat Studios, and we've had them previously on the show, and they made some fantastic games before. And this is a new release, so Mega Cat have kind of got it down. You know, they they've got the printing of the carts, they've got the producing of the games, the original boxes. So I'm pretty confident that this one's going to be funded. It looks really nice, actually. It's called Phantom Gear, and I was looking at the video, and what do you think about it, Dan? It, it's a platformer, but it looks like it's got Sonic kind of dynamics and movement so you know when you're jumping up to different platforms he kind of bounces off the side and that projects him around right and, okay and there's very kind of little just sonicy stuff but he's not going as fast it's more up and down platformy and he does loads of different attacks and stuff by the looks of it they've got like special yeah he's got and... like big fists hasn't he and uh does loads of attacks. And Fireballs, melee attacks, and yeah, I mean, it actually looks quite, you know, in, in terms of the attack system, very advanced for a Mega Drive game. Oh, yeah, and graphically as well. It looks absolutely stunning. And it does, you know, it's got a, a great Mega Drive soundtrack, as you'd imagine. Do you want to hear about the soundtrack on here? Oh, sure. Talking about how, how well they've worked on this. Listen to that. Oh, yeah. I want to buy it just for this. <laughs> so this is running at the moment on Kickstarter, and I imagine by the time the show comes out, it's going to be funded. Because at the time we're recording this, it's um, about 75% of the way there, but I'm looking at this at the moment, and it's shooting up by about 100 quid every 10 seconds. So. Yeah, and it's like uh, $15 for the minimum back, which yeah. is kind of the game ROM file and a manual and a digital download of the soundtrack as well, which is pretty cool. You know, straight away. So if you've got an EverDrive, you can just flash it on there. But then for fifty dollars, uh, you get the cart and you get a poster and all of this kind of stuff, and you'll be able to play it on your original. Yeah, and it com comes in the case as well. You know, it looks like the old school Mega Drive games. And it's great though when they do this. I mean, it, it is so insane how we're seeing these new games coming out that are really pushing these old systems way beyond the limits of what we imagined they could do back in the day. Oh, totally. Yeah, and they're getting better and better yeah. at it as well. Yeah, I mean, they've had a long time, I guess, to kind of perfect their <laughs> Learn skills. Learn all the but, yeah. tricks and tips, you know. Yeah, so definitely worth a back. And we love it, you know, when the retro crowd supports these projects as well because they're well worth it. Now, something else that we covered on the show um, probably about a year ago now was something unfortunately we couldn't make because we were out of the country at the time, but that was the 8-bit symphony orchestra that was on in Hull. Yes, yeah, so the 8-bit symphony, I, I wish I could have made it, but I was busy at the time, but it just looks absolutely fantastic. I've checked a review in The Guardian, actually, yeah, and they're saying, you know, Game Changer, this was a fantastic thing. Video game music, play, this is the tagline, video game music played by an orchestra is not new, but 8-bit symphony, a celebration of music from pioneering C64 composers, took many years of work. So they're kind of looking at, how long this took and then they're, they're actually respecting the history of guys like Rob Hubbard mm -hmm. and looking at the background of this and really seeing it as a British 
music kind of thing. And it's cool that Rob Hubbard is getting coverage in The Guardian. You know, that, that oh, now yeah, it's got that stuff talking and, about. And Chris Abbott and yeah. all of these guys. And, you know, even looking here, there's pictures of the Retro Computer Museum guys yeah. standing there. And it's it seems like a, a real celebration and kind of community event of British gaming and British music. And it, it's got to the stage now where that it is making the mainstream press. And it kind of feels like these guys are finally getting the respect that they deserve. Because, you know, we had Rob on the show. Mm. He did tell us at the time that, you know, no one really took computer music seriously back then. No, no. Yeah. And these, these guys are composers. Yeah. And it's amazing to hear it on an orchestra. You yeah. Know? And well, the videos I've seen of it look incredible. Yeah. And this proves it. You know, I'd love for them to do it again. And I was, um, I think I saw Mike Clark's, um, he, he put a few pictures on Facebook um, cause he was at the event, you know, saying how good it was. And um, there was a nice little tribute to Ben Daglish they did as well. Oh, awesome. At the end of, I mean, obviously, he was meant to be part of it. Well, if any of you listeners were at 8-Bit yeah. Symphony, please message us and tell us what you thought of it, and uh, we'll read some messages out on the show. Yeah, I mean, some of the best reviews I saw, I mean, there's actually mentioned in here as well on the, on the Guardian article, um, a guy called uh, Rich Garbutt, um, who's a Commodore 64 fan from Hull. He went there with his daughter as well, and he said, you know, his little girl had been brought up seeing him play on the Commodore 64, and she kind of knew the music as well because she'd heard the Sid tracks. Play in the, in the background, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and she loves it as well, and apparently she, she's going to learn them on the piano, it says in the article too. Oh, that's so. awesome. It's like yeah. a whole genre of music that's kind of been underrated or it hasn't been fully appreciated like it should. And I'm pleased it was a success as well, because I know we had Chris on, he was a bit like, he hadn't really done anything on this scale before, and they hadn't had these guys, you know, it was well, a bit kind of touching. Well, it's a big risk, isn't yeah. it, to kind of book a venue, have all these guys book a whole orchestra yeah. and have to have, you know, hundreds of people there. Yeah, and you've got to sell the tickets, you know, yeah, it's yeah. not cheap, yeah, so. Um, you well know, done, Chris. Yeah, absolutely, and hopefully it's yeah, the start of many more bigger things you might go on to next, so absolutely. So, uh, yeah, if you were there, do drop us a message, let us know what you thought of it, and we've definitely got to go to if there's ever anything like this happens again. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah, we can't be booking holidays on the same day. <laughs> Right then, before we get into our sh- chat with uh, one of my childhood heroes while we're on the subject, Sean Southern, he's coming up in just a moment. Let's give a big thank you to a massive supporter of the Retro Hour podcast, and that is The Economist. Now, The Economist is a publication that's been going here in Britain for over 170 years. What they do is they kind of sift through all this noise that we see in news today, focus on the essential information and give you the real story. And not only do they cover stuff like economics and finance, but also they do cover technology, science, video games as well. And there's an article here that I found I thought was really interesting, actually. And this is about Facebook. And they're talking about how Facebook should heed the lessons of internet history. Now, how's about this for an insult? <laughs> Some people have been talking, um, talking about Facebook as being a bit like the tobacco industry, saying, you know, it's addictive, it's bad for us, that kind of thing, it needs more regulation. Mm, yeah. But another comment here that they say is even worse is Facebook has been compared to the new Yahoo, a once internet giant that today is not anywhere to be seen. But they do mention here that, you know, Yahoo was never quite as big or as profitable as Facebook, but it does prove how quickly the internet landscape can change. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, before Facebook, all these places for social media existed. We were even talking about Plato, you know, they were yeah. doing social media <laughs> in the 60s. But if you think about stuff like 4chan... Yeah, and that, I went, before that, GeoCity. Yeah, you know, and, and some of the forums before that. If you've been on some of the forums, you won't think Facebook's that bad, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, content, yeah. if anybody's been on Moon Bunny, <laughs> you'll know what I'm on about. <laughs> but I, I remember Friends United. Friends were United, and that came along in the early 2000s. Oh, God, and... what was the early one? High Five, do you remember that? I don't I was ever on remember a, using I was that on one. really early social networks back then. But for me, I found GeoCities was one of the coolest things. And also, I quite liked... MySpace, how you could like just put a whole layer over the top and rebuild your whole site on top. I like that. Yeah. Being able to change it and not being stuck within a system. And you could play a little MIDI file when you went on your page yeah, and stuff. Yeah, do you remember yeah. all that? That was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I do kind of miss all that because nobody makes home pages anymore, do they? No, I mean, um, you can hardly customize your Facebook profile, can you? Not at all, yeah. But what they are saying here that the reason they're making this comparison is that their Facebook business model is being threatened by users are actually dropping off, you know, as the demographic kind of gets older. Yes. And, yeah. yeah. And advertisers are not happy as well, apparently. With I, the th- I think the youth, the youth have left the Facebook. It's for the old people, isn't it? Yeah. Now? <laughs> That's the kind of my mum's on Facebook and all our parents are, you know. Yeah, and us. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> 
Sorry. Yeah, we're <laughs> us oldies, you know. We don't know. We're not on TikTok or anything like that, are we? So. Tick what? Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, the internet landscape will constantly change and it is always a battle to keep up with it. But, I mean, it is a really interesting article, definitely worth a read. And if you'd like to check out The Economist for yourself, actually, we've got a great little offer for you. If you live in the UK and you would like to get your own free print copy of The Economist, we love having a you know, proper paper publication. Oh, yeah, and delivered to your door for yeah. free. That's awesome. So if you'd like to get a copy through the post, all you have to do is text the word retro and send it to 78070. And obviously, for doing that, you'll be really helping out the podcast. We really appreciate you showing some support to our sponsors. That's retro to 78070 to get your own free print copy of The Economist Through Your Door, the smart guide to the forces changing your world. Right then, are we ready to talk about some legendary games? Supercars, Lotus, Kickstart 2. This week's special guest, Short Southern. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guest. Um, I've got to say, you know, I don't want to make you blush or anything, Sean, but, you know, one of my childhood heroes because um, I did grow up playing your games. I mean, when I got my first machine, a Commodore Plus 4 back in the day and later on with games like Supercars and Lotus. So let's welcome onto the podcast the legend that is Sean Southern. Thanks very much. <laughs> now, Sean, before we get into those amazing games, um, there's a little bit of background on you. I mean, what, what originally got you into computers? Uh, I think they had a Commodore Pet at uh, school and... Uh... But I don't think there was anything more than Pet Basic on it at the time, but it was uh, stayed after school and had a play on that. And uh, just getting your computer to do what you told it and typing in things, I uh, was just really interested at the time. Something I could just create on my own, really. Did you get into any arcades at all? Oh, yeah. Well, obviously, I was probably playing in the arcades before that and uh, trying to recreate. I mean, you couldn't really do them on a pet, but... Uh, uh, once, once I got onto the VIC-20, it was like trying to recreate all my favourite games. I, I still, I mean, they're still the only ones I'll ever play if I get to an arcade, uh, things like Asteroids and Pac-Man. And I found one in Manchester the other day when my wife was shopping. It was in the... sells all crazy stuff. But uh, it had all the old arcade games, so I was on there for ages for playing for about an hour, and I completely lost her. <laughs> Phoenix. <laughs> Um, or oh, Phoenix. Like yeah, I love Phoenix. That was it. Kind of a, a space, in, well, a bit of a later Space Invaders clone, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, sort of a bit more like Galaxians and things like that, but all still using all the same sort of old chips, I think. What kind of arcade games did you play like back then? So I know some of your games were arcade influence that we'll get into a bit later well, on. Well, there's certainly the one, the, the Carnival one, it was a complete rip-off, obviously, most of my games. But yeah, I used to play Space Invaders at Youth Club and got very good at that, and Asteroids, Pac-Man... All the, and I say that's probably all I still play now if I ever get a chance. Well, you mentioned the VIC-20. Was that your first machine that you got at home? Yeah. Um, me and my friend were both going to get computers, and he nearly persuaded me to get an Acorn Atom, but uh, I got the VIC-20 and uh, then stayed with Commodores forevermore, really. Well, how did you learn programming, then? Th th this is one of these things I cannot remember, because I, I know I, um, we went on holiday to see my brother in America, and I saved me money and bought one of the machine code cartridges, and I'd already done a little bit of basic on the, the pet at school and the basic on the VIC-20, and I think I just must have learnt it myself. I mean, you couldn't really look on the internet then. Yeah. Well, you certainly couldn't. Um, but I don't, I've got no idea how I learnt machine code programming either. I might have got a book from a library or something like that, when uh, that was the only way to do it then. But I really can't remember how I actually learnt it, because I don't think it came with very many instructions. Yeah, I think I do remember I, I had some later Commodore machines, and you get like a, a manual with it that showed you a bit of basic, but there wasn't really much more than that, was it? Well, the Amiga used to have lots yeah. of books, detailed hard, hardware manuals, but back on the VIC-20, I mean, I don't think they expected anyone to be writing machine code at home, but the cartridge let you do that, and uh, I, I really don't know how I learned it, but... I, well, I did computer studies at school, but uh, I don't think they taught anything like that. Well, did you start making games at home then on your VIC-20? Yeah, I was about 15, I think, start of 1982. Um, I, I'd, I'd actually written some games and sold them in the back of a PC magazine. I uh, can never remember the name of it, but it's a weekly one, PCG or something. And you put like, classified adverts in the back, and I, I'd be copying tapes and sending them off to people for a fiver. And uh, I think I always saw an advert for someone, Mr. Chip, who worked in Van Dudno, and it was near where we used to go on holiday to Rell. So we thought, oh, that's close, we, we know the way, we go up on the train, and we met him, and uh, 
he wanted to sell the games I'd, I'd written, so I didn't have to put them in the back of magazines anymore, and just went from there. But yeah, I sold them on, on my own <laughs> to start with. See, Mr Chip's an interesting story because it's something I've kind of read conflicting things about. If you go on Wikipedia, it, re- it says that you're the founder of Mr Chip <laughs> yeah. Software. <laughs> but it was, a guy, was it a guy called Doug, was it? Yeah, Doug, Doug Bracey. We oh, actually right. took him, uh, we went and met him a couple of weeks ago, and he's about 74 now, and we went on the big zip wire in Snowdonia. Uh, it's a mile long, and he, he loved it, yeah. But yeah, he, he, he founded this company and started selling other people's games. And then uh, when we... I sort of joined up with him. He just sort of became an agent and, you know, took so much of the percentage and sold the games for us. And uh, then Andrew joined later on and uh, other people came and went, but mainly it was the two of us. Well, you mentioned Andrew Morris there. And how did you guys meet then? You, did he just join the company? Well, I think Andrew started working as a sort of a for Doug as a... You know, he was trying to get, always trying to get a big company going. You know, making a team, making games when you, you didn't really need that many people back then. But uh, I think being based in London, there was not too many people around. I mean, if you're in Liverpool or Manchester, I'm sure it'd be a lot easier. But Andrew used to work for him, and by the time that me and Andrew were doing the games together, we were both sort of equal partners in it and everything. Well, looking on Moby Games, it's kind of like, you know, the, the IMDB of the, the games world. Yeah. It's got Olympic Skier listed as your first released game. What Was that actually your first one, do you remember? Yeah, I think I sold that one myself, I think. Okay. Um, that and one, uh, Sub Shoot, which I'm sure you can imagine was uh, a rip-off of the submarine game. But, yeah, see, I can't remember. what I think maybe I did do the Skier one myself first and sold it, and then Doug uh, put it out, and I think it, you know, obviously got a proper cassette inlay and everything. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm never sure those things on Moby Games. Uh, there's games on there that I've never even heard of that they say I've done. And they put other ones that I've done down to other people, but I'm not bothered. Well, how did you guys end up linking up with uh, Mastertronics, and what were they like to work with? Well, Doug, Doug was always trying to sort of get people to interest in the games, and I think the, when Mastertronics came out, uh, I think we were sort of struggling to, to sell the games because uh, you know, there was a lot more games coming out. And I think he just sort of said that, right, well, we we can do lots of games for you. And uh, he sort of got, they, they sold a lot. They didn't give you very much, but uh, obviously they were very cheap in the first place. But it all worked out in the end. And uh, I think, you know, we didn't just do games because that was the same time we did uh, some of the, the bigger ones for Gremlin. But uh, it was great because uh, <laughs> lots of games I did all came out with Massatronics and all in the charts at the same time. Yes, yeah, so we did an episode last week with um, Anthony Goodyear, who was at Mastertronic, and he was telling us about you know the fact that they had a big distribution network, so you'd often see them in like uh, you know petrol stations on yeah. the on the M1 and all that. Yeah, yeah, I can't. Probably must have done twenty games or or twenty sort of different SKUs as they call them. Did you make much profit then? Because a lot of them were sold at like one ninety nine, weren't they? Well, I did keep a, a sort of a little record of what I, what I got, and I say some games would make a few hundred quid, some. If I was lucky, made a few thousand, but uh, some they only took, uh, you know, some of them take six weeks to write, some of them take a week, but uh, it was it was good money for me at the time. But I say that I don't know. I'm sure Mastertronics made a lot more selling them uh, as they did, but well, that's how it goes. What kind of age were you then? I mean, were you still like living with your parents? Well, no, I I actually moved out, but uh, I was about sort of 19. To 20, I think. Mm-hmm. I went to university for about three months and uh, left because it was getting in the way of my uh, <laughs> my career, if you want to call it that. What did um, your parents think of that then? Um, oh, well, uh, I think they wanted me to be a teacher or something, but I think they were quite happy in the end. <laughs> um, I think my dad was quite proud when some of the games did well and, you know, he sort of showed his mate down the pub. So, But they, 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 they were happy enough, I think. Well, we're uh, talking at the pub. Jackpot was one of your early kind of Mastertronic releases. Were you into Fruit Machines? And... Uh, yeah, well, it was when I was a lot younger, yeah. I used to put quite a bit of uh, pennies in them. But I was, I was actually trying to work out how they all worked and, uh, you know, we're, I'd, I'd be sitting there for hours copying the reels down so I knew what happens if you get the nudges and things like that. I wouldn't say I was uh, addicted, but uh, I was quite quite interested in them. So, so you kind by of... The, by the time I'd written what them, I, you know, I knew how they all worked as well, so... So you kind of reversed engineered them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember playing on them quite a while. Well, when the Commodore 64 came along, I mean, was that a bit of a revolution after you'd been working on the Vic? Well, it was the C16 before the 
some of sixty fours after. I can't remember. I think it was just after. I think I think sixty fours yeah. around eighty two. Yeah, then. Um, yeah, it, it, it was certainly. I mean, it got the sound chip, hadn't it? And uh, a lot more memory and graphics. I mean, the Vic twenty had three and a half k you could use, and this was about forty eight k you could use out of the sixty four. I think so. You could you could certainly do much bigger projects, although. Um, a lot of the time it was the same game, but with a lot better graphics. Yeah, it was, it was certainly a lot uh, more scope for things. I mean, one platform that I was particularly fond of, and you kind of really, you know, in my mind, owned this platform. You mentioned the Commodore 16 there. Um, I had the Plus 4 that was, you know, a compatible machine with a bit more RAM. Yeah. And, I mean, in my mind, there was two guys who really got the most out of that platform. There was a guy called Udo Gertz who did, like, um, winter events, um, a lot of those kind of sports games. And you as well, because you did so many great games on that system. Why did you focus a lot on the Commodore 16, and what was it like to program? Again, I... Uh, I, I... I don't really know why I specifically focused on it. You probably know that the Trailblazer was first out on the Commodore 16 before the Commodore 64. I think it was it was probably the more like uh, you could write. You didn't have to write a huge game for it, like because the Hobbit game was huge, wasn't it? Hmm. It, was, it was quite a big game. But for the C16, you could still write the small, fun ones like like your Pac-Mans and your Asteroids. But they they looked better. They probably ran faster. The, I think it had a lot more colours, didn't it? So I could probably just write them on my own, whereas with the C64 games, I think people were starting to starting to think about planning, you know, quite long comparative dev cycles to get the games done. So I think we did Super Scramble on the C64, which was uh, it did, didn't do that well, and that that was like kickstart, but with a lot more a lot more time put into it. And that's not necessarily a good thing, really. You mentioned Kickstarter, and that was a huge game. Um, what was the story behind the kind of development? Well, there was a, game, a program on TV, a BBC called Kickstarter, and that was it. Was just a you know, let's do a sideways scrolling thing because the, uh, the best thing about the Commodores were all you could really play on the good features with the scrolling and the colours, and later on with the Amiga with the copper list and all the glitter and things. So it was really good for doing sideways scrolling things like that. There might have been some other games around with looking like that at the time so it was just a case of writing something that looked good on the machine and played well and uh, I say I, I probably watched uh, the kickstart program quite a few times because obviously I uh, nicked the music from it as well yeah. I think. <laughs> in those days they didn't come after computer games for a no <laughs> someone wanted um, to do to put it out on one of these emulators and they were asking me so where's the music from I had to look it up it's some 1960s be my boogie woogie baby song or something that, that <laughs> someone had written, but I think they used it on the on the TV program as well, and they they they, they weren't bothered at all. <laughs> well, talking of Kickstarter, I mean that was one of my favourite games on the Commodore 16, and I remember my my best friend at school, Graham. He was like, you know, he, he had a Commodore 64, and he wanted Kickstarter because we used to play it all the time. And then the 64 version was like a completely different game. Well, the C16 one was based on a game I, I remember seeing in a fair once where you were bouncing a something up and bl- bursting balloons because it, it was completely different you know i don't know why if i never never even probably couldn't do the the, the graphics or the, the speed of it or something for the c60 I don't, I don't really know why it was different but yeah it was just a completely different game bouncing around and b- bursting balloons i think I actually think, you know, I mean, it was the one I had, so I found it the most fun. But recently, I don't know if you saw, the Commodore 16 version was actually ported to the 64 by fans about a year or two ago. Oh, right, OK. Yeah, so. I, I, it amazes me when people are still writing C64 games now. I mean, for a start, I, I don't think I could, because I don't remember how anything worked in <laughs> machine code. Oh, I'd have a job with that now, but it's well, uh, crazy the scene how they've got. With Kickstart 2, what did you want to kind of improve over the original? Well, this is about when Andrew got involved and, uh, you know, obviously the graphics were so much better and, you know, the animation of everything. Cause, uh, if you compare them side by side, the one really does look <laughs> terrible. But, I mean, the, the control was pretty much the same, but all the animation, the graphics and the course designer just sort of naturally fell into place as to for what to do with the sequel, really. Talking of racing games as well, I mean, the, the races you did on the 16, like Speed King, I remember, the bike game, and there was a Formula One simulator as well. Which yeah, I, I think they were pretty much the same program. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's slightly different graphic for the, uh, the vehicle. Someone, uh, this was a Mastertronics thing. I think someone just said, oh, we've got a license for this. Can you do a version of this? Just take that and put some cars in it. <laughs> and you know, that, that working with Mastertronics, you know, that, that was good. They did that, and that, that did pretty well. 
Were those games hard to do? Because, I mean, you know, the fact that you achieved that kind of frame rate and stuff well, on the system. Again, that one didn't really even have um, any other sort of coloured roads. That one, again, was like an arcade. There was used to, I think it was called Night Rider or something, or Night Racer in the arcades. It was a bit of vector graphics, basically. So as you drove along, all you saw was these little posts coming towards you. So it was very similar to that. I mean, as you know, most of our games are rip-offs or something or other. <laughs> and you had that when you went around the corner, like the tick, 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 tick. You get that sound effect as well, look. Yeah. The adrenaline flowing. How much direction did you get from Mastertronics? Like, oh, in... well, none at all. From none? Mastertronics. You were just left to it? Yeah, I mean, maybe for that Speed King, they just told us we'll do that. But all the other games, we used to just do... I, I used to write, oh, I'll do this for a game today, or I want to do a game with a jetpack or something. And some of those games went out, some of them, some of them might not have. <laughs> but uh, the, no, they just took really whatever we gave them. Would they approve games or remove features, or would they just no, go ahead? I don't really remember them ever doing that, Mastertronics. I think they were they were quite happy to just put things put things out. And I don't. I mean, I might have. Um, I know when we did um, Lotus for Gremlin, uh, one of the high score screens had a curry recipe on it, and they were a bit no, we're not having that. Take <laughs> the silly names out. <laughs> or that long scrolling uh, message. Well, one thing that, you know, was really every gamer went out and got them in the 80s was the magazines. I mean, you know, they were kind of before the internet, that's where you'd yeah. find out what games were worth buying. What was your relationship like with the magazines? Did you, did you have much to do with them? Well, originally, I mean, we didn't really know anyone in the magazines, especially being in Landudno, and I, I used to, like, go to Smith's every day, and, oh, there's a new review out, and you'd be sitting there, and are you going to buy that? Yeah, 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 I'll take it, <laughs> And I uh, really look forward to seeing that because I could make or break what people saw of everything. And uh, later on, when we got the Amiga, we did have the odd magazine sort of come in to interview us and, uh, up, up in London now. Or sometimes we'd go, I think we went down to a couple and you know, just sort of took pictures or holding the games maybe. Or So, yeah, we, they, they, they seem to like us most of the time. Did you um, guys kind of notice differences with the attitudes of magazines and maybe the scores of magazines? And would you kind of go, oh, cautious of those guys? Or, <laughs> you know? uh, well, I think the Zap guys uh, were most cared what they thought because they were one of the most sort of highly, you know, when they made sort of comments, they were, you go, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're right. And some of the magazines just seem, used to, seem, seem to like the game more than was feasible sometimes. <laughs> Um, not not very often we got some bad bad sort of reviews, but I think when we did, we probably deserved them. I think the, there were a few little problems with some of the games that you know you just work on them possibly for too long and you can't quite get them right. And uh, the Super Scramble one, I say, it's just just too picky to play, really. Yeah, I mean, I guess you push those platforms to the limits. The eight-bit machines trying to do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, just you know, sometimes you get an idea for the game, and sometimes it, it works really well. And usually, the simpler the idea, the better, mm. especially with the control methods and things. But when the controls get a bit over the top and difficult to do, that's probably when they don't work so well. Well, you did the um, original Pac-Mania, um, not the version that was ah, in yeah. the arcades. <laughs> I should sue them for the name, shouldn't I? <laughs> what was the story there, then? Uh, well, it was a, it was a Pac-Man game that uh, I didn't get sued for, <laughs> with uh, hyperspace ports, like uh, stolen from asteroids, I think. And, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's amazing how you, what you could get away with. <laughs> <laughs> and then Pac-Mania that came out where, where you could jump, that they just took the name, you'd used it before. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to complain, but, I mean, it's, it's just a play on the words, isn't it, obviously, the, the name. I don't think it was very difficult to think of. Well, another amazing game on the 16 was uh, Bandits at Zero, which, um, for those that haven't played it, it was kind of like a Defender game. Well, kind of a clone of Defender in a way, but it, it also had like a refueling sequence. And then... Yeah, there was a game uh, yeah. on the VIC-20 uh, where you used to have to go and refuel. I used to play that a lot with my, my friend's house. Again, I can't remember the name. If you tell me, I'm sure remember it but you used to have to get go down and refuel on the ground and things would come and attack you and you have to take off again uh it was a bit like that a bit like defender and i think we did on the c16 because I, I wanted to make the, it go dark at night and there was all the different shades on the c16 yeah so this, this is what you used to do with, uh, uh, with games where, when, when you couldn't do or whatever you wanted you had to try and play on the the best features of the machine and make it look better 
It was very atmospheric, though, because it would kind of fade out and it would go dark and then the music would kind of come in. Yeah. And then you had to do, I mean, it was so, you had to be pixel perfect doing it as well, that review. Yeah, I, I think with, with Defender and what was uh, Scramble in the arcades, I think a lot of games I used to play, like Tiger Heli and things, they'd be firing lots of bullets at you and if you weren't pixel perfect with that joystick... They all depend on getting a decent joystick. You find one of those games about five years later, thinking, "Great, I'm going to have a go at this," and the joystick wouldn't move left or something. Just, ah. <laughs> and that bit, that Commodore 16 joystick that you got free with the machine, yeah, wasn't wasn't all that robust. I broke a few of those. Yeah, that one wasn't too good. I remember the the, the, the old Atari joysticks used to play a lot of uh, Jeff Minter's games, yeah. the, the Camels. Uh, used to play them a lot, um, and the, yeah, you used to have a really have to have a really strong Atari joystick. To get the get it to move exactly when you wanted to. Well, one of the features of the games, and uh, especially with the Lotus series, was the the music. And um, we know Barry Leach also worked with doing some of the uh, Lotus stuff. We've had him on the show previously. Did you ever do any composition yourself? Um, most of the eight bit stuff was probably all my music. The music on Trailblazer was mine. I did piano grade five. I couldn't do it very any. Couldn't get any further than that. I was the probably taking uh, starting to play with the computer rather than the piano but uh, just about string some of the tunes together but they they were very uh, uh, electronic shall we say? it's a very sort of like arpeggios going dee 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 all the time <laughs> uh, yeah I, I once it got to the point of using sound tracker and things oh no I was well out of my depth there because I did uh, I did piano as well but up to grade 5 I think you need to get theory if you have to get further <laughs> I think that had quite a lot of people have stopped the theory at grade was okay five. I just couldn't do the sight reading I ah think. sight reading's uh, hard yeah I've got fat fingers you know, I can't uh, I try playing the guitar but I can't play them because my fingers don't stretch very far <laughs> Well, let's talk about a big game then, obviously Trailblazer. Um, that really pushed the boundaries of the system. And I'm, it's quite interesting you mentioned that game came out on the Commodore 16 first because when we had Andrew Morris on, I asked him that and he was sure it was Commodore 64 first. But it was the 16, was it, it came out on top? I, I think it was, yeah. yeah. I see and, and now Andrew uh, will remember a lot more than me because he doesn't <laughs> drink at all and uh, <laughs> I'm blaming that for forgetting things. But yeah, I think um, what I did with, what we did with that is, okay, see, again, it, you worked out what the computer could do and well come on the Commodore 16 it, w- it wasn't very powerful so to be able to get to the all the things to look like uh, moving left and right and scrolling towards you you're just using the what the hardware could do and it could change the colors at various points down the screen and we had four different sort of iterations of the, the, the track moving left to right so basically you're getting it all really fast for free and then you used all pretty much all your power that you've got left to draw the ball and because of that, people have never seen anything moving that fast and smooth, supposedly, before. So I think that, that grabbed people's attention. Was that like a totally original game, or did you buy certain anything? Ah, well, there's, yes, here's another one. I think, now, now this was, um, oh, I can never remember the name of it, and I keep telling people this. It was a sideways <laughs> scroll one guy uh, with, a, with like a five-lane track, and he used to run and kick coke cans and jump over. I think it's called Hype or something. Yeah, but. that does ring a bell. But obviously that was sideways on, so putting it forward on made it look... uh, And it was about the same time as Space Harrier was out, I think. Maybe, yeah. And But Space Harrier obviously was using dedicated, like, arcade stuff. But it's probably working pretty much the same way in that uh, you'd have to scroll things sideways just to show a different view and then change the colour of the track as it came towards you. And was that game a big seller? Um, I think it... It got very good reviews, but it didn't actually sell uh, that many. It, obviously, uh, being being 19, it, it did, did me all right, yeah. But uh, I think it got in the charts, but I don't think it stayed there as long as some of the other ones. I think I think it's to do with having a ball as the lead character. Probably didn't resonate with people very much. <laughs> yeah, I get, yeah, maybe it was the, what, the cutesy platformers and stuff like that. Yeah, I've had got like a, a plumber running along or something, or a hedgehog. <laughs> Hedge- oh yeah, well, <laughs> if you'd have seen the original uh, graphics for Kid Chaos, they're uh, very like uh, a hedgehog. It was a black cat with spiky hair. Yeah, we need to talk about that game when we get into the Amiga years, because yeah, okay. that was one of Ravi's favourites. <laughs> well, I mean, did you have any games that kind of, you know, around this 8-bit time that, that didn't work out, you know, stuff you wanted to do, but the hardware wasn't capable or you couldn't quite get the programming right? Um, I think I probably sent two or three to Mr Chip. I think one was called Dingbot Wombat Kink Kangaroo, because I couldn't think of any other name. 
and it was just a sort of a random, you'd be sitting there and all loads of things would come and attack you. It's probably a bit bored. I couldn't think of anything else to do that day. Um, um, most of them most of them went out, though. Uh, I said, oh, they just used to leave me to it and, oh, here's another game. Oh, I've done this one in two weeks. I've done this one in four weeks. Uh, it was until we until we got onto the the, the Trailblazers and the uh, Amiga stuff when we actually had a bit more direction. Well, how did you make that transition to 16-bit? I went. We, we when the Amigas first came out. I mean, Doug and Mr. Chip were very keen for us to go on to the Amiga, and I actually sort of I got the Amiga and it was sitting in my house for a bit, and uh, I was still writing C64 games or, or something. And uh, I'm, I'm not saying they were annoyed, but they were going, "Come on, you want to get on the Amiga now?" <laughs> So eventually, um, let me think, well, the first thing we did on the Amiga was probably Supercars, wasn't it? By, by which time, I say, they got Andrew in, and he was, uh, you know, Goldie's ideas, and he was very into his cars, as you know. So uh, that's that was our first thing, first thing we did, and that took about six months, and Gremlin were interested pretty much from the start, because they, they, we'd done Trailblazer with them, so they knew us. Yeah, because if you think of supercars as well, it's uh, overhead racer, and you really don't get that many these days. But there was a lot in that genre, like micro machines, and I remember well, I think later we were before micro machines. Yeah, if I yeah, remember right, we, we were copying super sprint or yeah, super sprint. It was called, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. I'd actually done a speed sprinter for the C sixty four, which was just uh, it didn't scroll, did it? Which was like the original super sprint in the arcade, the one with the big um, steering wheels. So I think it was based on that, but obviously with Andrew's graphics, uh, it, it looked better. And then suddenly it, they all had weapons and the bit with the shop, I don't know where that came from, but it, it certainly added depth to it. I mean, when you got into these 16-bit platforms, like, like the Amiga, for example, I mean, did you kind of have to... Did the games take a lot longer to make? So I guess, you know, there was a lot to be more in them and you have more RAM to fill and graphics. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, they had to have a lot more sort of to them and they, they all took about six months each to make. Because even when you got onto a sequel and you got a lot of the code there, obviously you've got to add so much new stuff to it. But we tended to always, I think we were told, oh, you want to get a game out for Easter and a game out it before Christmas. So we'd get one ready for March, one ready for September, and then leave it, you know, leave it to Gremlin or whoever to sell them. So that, that, that naturally became how long they took. So we just crammed as much as we could in. Uh, obviously, uh, some of those games still had little. Um, shoot them up hidden in them so i never got bored <laughs> i remember the one in lotus too yeah. did you have to hire any extra staff or get any kind of no. extra artists aboard no we didn't we didn't um the, we uh, gremlin occasionally helped with things like music and sound effects um i they don't think they ever did any graphics for us i think andrew was probably quite precious about that and certainly no one else would attempt to write code because uh, i didn't even have a proper assembler at that time, I just used to have little pieces of paper with uh, location 10s, the score, and things like that on, because that's how I'd started, and it's very hard to change. That's probably why it was so fast. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> possibly. Did, did you guys, uh, what tools did you use for development? So was it like D-Paint and stuff like that? Yeah, I think Andrew had like, paint, and uh, I, I used to use something called DevPack, I think, on was that on the C... That was on the Amiga, yeah, No, DevPack. Do, no do, yeah, DevPack on the Amiga, and DOSMon, which mm. is an uh, assembler on the... Uh, but they were both assemblers, so they didn't use any C or anything like that. So, yeah, and uh, when we first did a game on the uh, PC, I still wrote it in assembler, and we found it very hard to hire staff who wanted to write in <laughs> On x86, yeah. Well, yeah. What did you think of some of the games that were coming out that were, like, direct ports from Atari and um, stuff that was also done in C? And Well, I mean, if they were quick enough, um, it really doesn't matter. And I mean, I've, I've learned to be a lot more... Uh, forgiving and not try and write everything myself but uh, if if you know if they were not too fast i'd probably think well you could do that a bit better if you didn't just port it but um which games particularly i mean uh, the arcade ones they could probably handle couldn't they yeah i remember the terrible version of outrun on, on the, the amiga from the atari st well Out, outrun was what what uh um lotus was probably based on mm. of course I remember trying to work out for ages how to how they'd done everything, and probably they did it a completely different way because they had graphics, special graphics chips. But uh, it, you know, it had the same effect in the end. Were you going under the Magnetic Fields brand by then? I mean, how did that brand come, kind of come around then? Did that come out of Mister Ship Software? Oh, yeah, Mister Ship. They wanted a new thing when they were moving into 16-bit again, probably to try and attract more people and to 
you know, to have a have a brand. And uh, I think one of the guys was very into uh, is Jean Michel Jarre. They used the Wagner sample in there yeah, for the, the, the start of it. So yeah, that, was, that that went on the start of all the games. Then the magnetic field thing. Yeah, Ravi tried to do, do an impression of it earlier. It wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> so M- Magnetic Fields wasn't your company then? We need to, no, we need no, to no, crack Wikipedia was, here, don't that we? That was Doug again. <laughs> right, um, yeah. he, I say, but, but Andrew and myself both sort of worked self-employed for Doug, you know, only only through Doug, but we're self-employed really. So he, he, he always tried to get other teams going, but and we tried to help some of them, but they just didn't really get going. Again, I think probably because of where the, where the location was. Well, you mentioned that you started working with Gremlin Graphics instead of uh, Mastertronics at this time. Why did you change? Well, I think Doug um, had... We started doing the Lotus game. And uh, no, no, it was uh, Supercars, wasn't it? And I think he was just trying to... He didn't obviously didn't want to do that with uh, Mastertronics because I don't, don't know if they did any the Amiga games. They might have. I can't remember. But he, he probably he was still trying to look for people to do better deals with. So we'd go and visit people. I mean, I'm sure we went to Ocean before. We went with Kid Chaos. We went to see them and went to see other people. And Gremlin were interested. Probably I mean, because of Trailblazer, but that's, he would have done Trailblazer first. So then he went uh, to them with Lotus. Did he have much to do with like Ian Stewart and stuff then? Yeah, well, I've, I've still, I, I know Ian Stewart. I, we used to see him whenever we went up there. And James, who used to run the technical part. And uh, they were, you know, we went to quite a few... Uh, Sometimes you know, they take us out on cars and it takes us running around car test tracks with lotuses and things. So we got to do a few of those things together. Well, that was going to be my next question, actually, because obviously I mean, we'll get into Lotus now. The first game, um, Lotus Esprit Turbo Challenge 1990, that game came out. Yeah. Um, so how did you get the Lotus license? So, well, think um, this was completely down to Gremlin. We okay. started doing this game and it had Porsches in it. And uh, Andrew, he wasn't that miffed, obviously, to, to be told, oh, yes, you can do a game with Lotus, isn't it? It's a proper license and it should do really well because of it. But he's, he'd drawn all the Porsches. He's got the pictures somewhere. He's probably showed you. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, he, we, they just changed it for Lotuses, and most of the rest stayed the same. We'd probably half written the game before they told us. And did you get a Lotus in the end? I didn't, no. <laughs> I think Andrew had one. <laughs> did you get to drive any, though, when you were making Oh, them? yeah, they, they took, they, we did quite a few things like that. Um, we went to the test track in Norwich on, uh, on one of the days when I think it was about 38 degrees in 1999. Or, n- no, sorry, 1990, yeah. And... Uh, Oh, it was so hot, and we were driving around in those things. You could barely see over the windscreen when I'm sitting, and because I'm quite tall, and I had to lie back and couldn't see the ground. <laughs> but yeah, we had a, had a drive of them, and I think for other games, I think we sort of did rallying and things later on. Well, did Lotus themselves have any demands or changes they wanted to make on the game? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think they, they they had to approve things. I'm not sure they had any particularly want any changes but they, they certainly uh, had to like agree that the cars looked correct and all the I think some of the pages had specifications and things on like that but I'm sure Android do those correctly anyway yes yeah, I guess you know big brands like that are quite protective about merchandise I guess aren't they I think there was another Lotus game a lot later on wasn't there so uh, mm. we, we didn't have anything to do with that one but uh, they probably got a lot more input on that one well, the series really came into its own with the second game, Lotus 2. Um, what changes did you make there when designing the second game, and how did you want to improve upon the well, first Well, a, a lot of people said, uh, when, when it came out, said that, you know, why, why did we change the laps and things? But, again, this was more making it like OutRun, and I think it, I, I, I always wanted to do the sort of the checkpoint-based thing, just have you run out of time and the next level and everything, make it more arcadey and... I'm, I'm glad we changed it. I mean, then the third one came out and we'd put everything back in it. <laughs> but uh, it, I certainly wanted to get all the weather effects and all the different courses because as, as good as uh, I, I like playing the first Lotus one because it's very sort of tense and you've got to plan it and everything, it's nice to have all the new graphics and all the new sound effects and different you know features in the game. Yeah, and the engine sound effects and that, you know, the checkpoint, that was always like really... Ah, that was Andrew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, he insisted on doing all the voices. When you heard Barry Leach's music, what was it like uh, when you first kind of heard it? And um, did you realise that it was going to be such a hit? I, I should know all these, but Barry did the original one for Lotus, didn't he? Uh, Lotus 2, uh, he Lotus was on, yeah. 2, yeah. Lotus 2, right, yeah, all the different music. So, I mean, they were very, really atmospheric for all the... They all worked really well for all the, the different scene, 
scenarios, the sand and the fog and everything. So they were great. Yeah, I mean, they really added to it. Well, with the third game, I mean, like you said, it was a bit more of a, a complex affair. You even had stuff like the, um, I think it was called Rex, wasn't it? The environment editor. Yeah, we tried working out a way where we could piece it together. Um, but it became so you know difficult trying to work out how you would... It, it, I mean, you could have easily sort of decided all this, but how the editor was going to work... It was, you know, going to turn it left and showing all the graphics on the screen for do this. So in the end, we just had all these random things which made the course really windy or really steep or everything. And it, because of that, there wasn't that actually much designing needed uh, by the player. So you could actually have a code that you could pass to each other and play each other on the same course, which became a big part of it. So I know you also like stuff like the, the future level where you go over parts of the road and the, there'd be lasers and all that. And yeah. I had that on the Amiga 1200 and it ran great, but on the 500 it would start to stutter a bit sometimes yeah. and that frame rate would go down, which, you know, the game was famous for in the second one. I mean, was it a bit too much for the yeah. hardware, do you think? It was because we'd put so many little checks and extra things in uh, that some of the courses definitely did, did take longer, especially when you had to draw big walls and cliffs and things. And all the extra little bits that you say, well, are we doing this? Are we doing that? Is it, have we got to draw this? It all just slowed it down just, just a bit too much, really. Well, also the concept cars in there, did you kind of get any plans about them or was it just uh, uh, guesswork? Was it the M2, was it Lotus M2? Yeah, I think so. W- were they actually w- real Lotus cars, though, were they? I think, yeah, in the third game, I think it was a concept car, you know, the green one, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, well, Andrew would have uh, probably had access to things like that. I don't think he invented them. I don't think they'd have let him uh, design his own Lotus. Yeah, Yeah, it was cool it was in the game, though, you know, the only chance that you'd ever get to to race one, you know, it was pretty cool. Well, the CD32 came out, and the the kind of main aim for Amiga was to get Sonic at that time, and uh, a game that you guys created was Kid Chaos, which I'd probably say is the closest thing that we have in frame rate, in parallax, in uh, speed as well. Um, was that the kind of idea to attempt to get Sonic on the Amiga? Oh yeah, i say if you saw the original character, the Cosmic Kitten as it was, it looked very like Sonic, uh, sort of black head and spiky, so it wasn't blue, but uh, it looked very like that and when it ran it was very very similar and it was again yeah just a complete sort of rip off really of sonic um but we what we wanted to we've never done a game like that and we wanted to try and do it and you could always add lots of fun little bits in that i remember playing one of the best one of the bits when we were testing it, it was like you had to jump down somewhere and get chased by a laser and because you'd be running at one speed and the laser would be coming behind you it was all really tense and everything and it was really really fun to play i think we did in the end put a few too many unexplained deaths in there i think you, you had to you had to just guess and i think we we got told off a bit for that by some of the reviews and probably rightly but uh there was so much in that game that you can watch uh long plays of it on the on the YouTube and I take about four hours to play all the way through <laughs> it. And it did take two years to write. And it, it had a really nice soundtrack. It was a really well presented. You must have put a lot of effort into that. Um, they, Andrew found some people who uh, did the music. Now, they had a funny name. Right? It's probably on the credits, but I can't remember. Uh, a couple of lads, they live pretty local to me. Um, we let them sort of design all the, the sounds for that, gave them all the graphics and said this is what it'd be like. So they did a great job, yeah. So was there a point where they were kind of like, we can't have a main character as an animal because uh, it's too close to Sonic? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. they did think this was too, too close, and that's uh, where... I don't know who thought of the Kid Chaos character, maybe maybe Andrew, but uh, it sort of went naturally with sort of swinging the club round and breaking everything, which is similar to jumping on and collecting rings, I suppose. And it was kind of like... Uh, Kind of around the Chuck Rock and the kind of caveman-y stuff yeah, that right. was going with yeah. European gaming at the time. He would have definitely have uh, based it on the, something he'd seen. So were you um, disappointed with the Amiga CD32's performance um, uh, with sales and its short shelf life? Yeah, it, did, it didn't seem to really have much more that it could do other than extra content. It wasn't really any... Um, any different you know it was uh, everyone could still put their old games on it and i don't think people really thought it was going to sell enough to to warrant making that much more of an effort really i think we tried to do put more into ours uh but most of the time it was just a case of getting more of the same in 
And uh, what did you think of the other kind of Sonic clones like Mr. Nuts and... Um, oh, God. There was, there was quite uh, a few, actually. <laughs> I, I'm not the biggest game play. I, I mean, I say I still play Asteroids, but I, I don't sit in for hours. I, I wouldn't really see many other people's games. I don't know whether that's good or bad. Um, Probably for the best. <laughs> well, maybe maybe in some cases. I used to play a lot of the, the Jeff Minter's stuff just because it was like really fast and you had to be really... I think they call it twitchy now, twitching games or whatever. We have to really quick reactions, but I, I couldn't get into all these uh, uh, the big games. They have to stay there for hours. Well, Je- Jeff's be writing them for one thing. Well, Jeff's been making some modern versions of his games. Do you think you'd ever do any re- remakes or reduxes of any of your titles? Um, I've, ne- I've never really been asked, and I don't really uh, myself. Because I still write, still do programming and whatever to the time now. Uh, I do that all day, so when I get home, I just want to relax, really. But mm. never know. What, what is your day job now then? I'm um, a programmer. For, we, we, uh, we've had various incarnations of this company, but we now uh, we've got a game called Golf Clash, and I've done. I do the engine code for that. And uh, yeah, I get to do something different every day. And there's about thirty of us. Uh, it takes now because they've got advertising teams and test teams and customer support and everything. It's just two-player golf over the internet. Um, uh, it's great. I still get to do what I like every day. And uh, what what do you think of the recent kind of retro resurgence? And well, the... I say I'm amazed that um, people are still interested in it. I, I, I'm I, I still like the idea of the, how the games play. Uh, I'm, I'm all for getting the graphics looking better. But I think it's uh, quite odd, horrible looking at some of my graphics from a long time ago. <laughs> See, it's interesting. I've, I've always kind of wondered that, like, you know, when, when you when it's something you made and then I guess you're kind of looking back at your younger days when you see the old games as well, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it probably certainly brings back memories of staying up all night and then still going to college the next day. So staying up all night writing games or drawing horrible mountains to go back in the past, uh, past in the background. Well, I mean, they're a great childhood memories for us as well, Sean. So it, it's been amazing getting your stories of uh, some of our all-time favourite games. So thank you so much for coming on this week. Oh, thanks.